Rod, are you about ready? I'm ready. All right. I think we're going to go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, so good evening. This is Wyatt Davis. I'm the president of the New Hampshire Astronomical Society, and I'd like to welcome you to the March 2021 New, New Hampshire Astronomical Society meeting. Um, I think we may have a few guests tonight, and if, if so, welcome. We're really glad that you joined us. Hopefully you saw the promotion about this on Facebook and kind of decided to drop in, and we hope you like what you see tonight and will choose to come back and maybe even think about joining us at some point in the future. Um, let me share with you our agenda for the evening. So tonight, I'm going to introduce in more depth here in a second, Rod Malise from Mobile, Alabama, uh, who's with us tonight. And that's really great. I'm looking forward to that. And we appreciate what Rod's doing to join us. I'm also going to give you a briefing on what we have coming up for our April presentation. Uh, we have, of course, in the news with Steve Rand, ladies and gentlemen. Um, and then we're going to move to our business meeting. We've got finance updates, but we've got some really interesting and exciting information about our membership and some of the things that are happening there, are really positive trends. And then we're going to spend some time, and I hope everybody will stay and the public is invited to stay for this part of our business meeting to hear a little bit more about our mission, our vision, and some of the things we're doing as a plan for the Astronomical Society. So that's a quick overview of what we've got going on this evening. We appreciate you joining us. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce this month's speaker, and this is Mr. Rod Molise. He is a contributing editor of Sky and Telescope magazine and is familiar to amateur astronomers as the author of numerous books and magazines and articles on every aspect of astronomy, amateur and professional. He is most well known for his books on the Schmidt Cassegrain Telescope, SCT, and especially Choosing and Using a New Cat by Springer. This is now in its second edition has become a standard reference for these instruments. In addition to Sky and Telescope and his books, Rod's writings can be found on his popular online blog, Uncle Rod's Astro Blog. Somehow, he also manages to find time to teach astronomy to undergrads at the University of Southern Alabama in Mobile and to voyage the night sky with his beloved scopes. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm really glad to have Uncle Rod Molise. Rod, take it away. Thank you very much, Wyatt, and thank you for having me, uh, even virtually. Very happy to be with you all. And all I got to say is let's get started. I got a bunch of slides. I've got another meeting after this one. And uh, if you all will, hold your questions to the end, and I will certainly take the time to answer each and every one of them that I can answer. Anyway, let's see if this works. Do you want more milk or ice cream? Okay. I'm not seeing my presentation on here for some reason. Uh, it's possible that this computer restarted itself. Let me let me uh, see if I can get out a full screen view. And yeah, that's what happened. Silly old computer. Give me just a moment here, folks. Let's try the share thing again, and here we go. Luckily, Zoom doesn't panic me anymore after using it for, what is it, a year now? So we can get this stuff, uh, get this stuff down. Well, good evening, and I'm pleased and happy to be with y'all and happy to share you share with you a little bit about one of the things that's interested me, observing from less than perfect skies for about uh, 25 years from the beginning of the 1990s until, oh, about seven years ago, I lived uh, not far from the center of a city of 250,000. So uh, needless to say, my skies were compromised, but I still wanted to observe and not just the moon and planets. And that's what this is all about. The universe from your bright backyard. Uh, I remember over the years, I would be happy to get out to the club dark site uh, once a month when we had a dark site, which we didn't always have one. 
And after a year or two of living downtown and finding out I maybe got out with a telescope uh, once a month, once every couple of months, I was tired of it and I wanted to observe. Uh, and, you know, I went to star parties. I don't know if any, any of y'all recognize this one here. It's pretty far from your stomping grounds. That is the formerly famous. It's not maybe quite what it used to be, at least as far as star parties. Chiefland Astronomy Village in Chiefland, Florida. Very dark skies, very nice people, but uh, that's like from another time. But I would get down to Chiefland whenever I could. But... Uh, you know, how often can you get to a major star party like this one? I know you know where this is, don't you? Of course you do. This is good old Prude Ranch, just a stone's throw from McDonald Observatory. Yes. Hard to believe this was 20 years ago, 20 freaking years ago. Anyhow, the bottom line, and Sir William Herschel, the greatest of all amateur astronomers, and yes, he was by our standards anyway, and amateur astronomers, things weren't quite so cut and dried back then. He was an amateur though. And uh, he was also a musician, a very accomplished musician and composer. And he likened observing to playing a musical instrument. And one of the aspects of that being that if you don't practice your skills, go to poop. But there's a solution folks the good old backyard. And this was actually the front yard of good old Chaos Manor South in downtown Mobile, Alabama in the Garden District a few years ago, a few. And this is what the sky looked like there. Uh, I would say on a good night, maybe magnitude three, 3.5 at Zenith. Hey, surely you can't see anything from the sky like that. Now, can you? Actually, you can. You can see the entire Messier, even the been there objects like M74, M101, and M97. Now, the been there objects uh, are those Messiers and others that uh, you just have, if you're observing from light pollution, you have to be content to say, I've been there. Uh, you're not going to see much of M74 and M101. The M97 is a different story with a decent filter, which we'll talk about a little later. M101, I could see it on a good night with an eight inch reflector from my garden district backyard, but it just showed up as a glow, a big glow in my field. But you would not believe how happy I was just to see that big glow. Uh, and it's not just the message, you can see lots and lots and lots of NGCs. You can see supernovae and NGC galaxies. Uh, all kinds of stuff, plus all the little creatures, uh, the urban fauna that have learned to live alongside man, like my little friend here. Hmm. This was about 25 years ago, maybe 30. And we do know that uh, you can't just be a possum and call yourself Irish. Now, can you? Although everybody's Irish on St. Patrick's Day, they say. What if you don't live in a detached home with a yard? Well, a balcony might do. It's limited, but you'd still maybe be amazed at what you could see over the course of a year. If you've got access to a rooftop, man, even better. Just don't fall off. Uh, of course, the mainstay is a local club. Some clubs only have observing at their sites once a month. Others are more flexible. You may be able to go out uh, basically whenever you want to, but that's, that's a solution, but not one you can always take advantage of. And uh, who wants to go out to the club site on a work night or a school night? Uh, you may have, like we did uh, or still do, a science museum out in the suburbs, still light polluted, but they were amenable to us using their site when we didn't have an actual dark site and uh, you just have to hunt around. How about parks? Parks are a possibility, but they're, they can be problematic. If you think you have a park you can use, and I'm talking about a city park, uh, not a state park or a national park or something like that. Uh, it's uh, incumbent upon you to uh, 
visit it during the day and at night and try to gauge what is going on there. Are there a lot of street people, uh, drug deals, whatever, that are going to make you nervous? Uh, and I don't necessarily mean that street people are going to harm you or that they are bad people, but they will make some people nervous. And if you're nervous, you can't pay attention to your telescope and you might as well not, you're, you're going to be jumping at every twig that snaps. You might as well not be there. Talk to the neighbors around the park. They'll tell you what goes on. Uh, of course, never observe alone. And that, that kind of goes everywhere. At a club dark site, uh, anywhere. Not that, you know, Mothman is going to get you, but what if you have a medical problem? Always try to observe with somebody. Uh, have your cell phone with you, of course. Uh, but the problem, the biggest problem, at least down here with observing from a city park, is because of perceived problems by the city fathers, many of them closed at sunset or not long after. I'm sometimes asked if you should uh, be armed on your uh, observing expeditions. Down here, that's not that uncommon. I certainly don't go armed, but it's, uh, I don't know. The problem with it is that in many areas of the world, it's not an option. Uh, but more importantly, if you're so freaking nervous that you feel you need to pack iron, you're not going to be able to sit there and pay attention to what's in the eyepiece. It'll be like you're in that city park with the homeless people shuffling around, uh, God love them, that every time a twig snaps, you're going to think it is somebody coming to get you and your night will basically be spoiled. And again, a nine millimeter won't help you with a dead car battery, but a cell phone will. You know, the funny thing though, <clears throat> the only times I felt nervous while observing have been out in the country. Never at any city location, I guess, because I'm used to it. But out in the country, I start thinking, hmm, was that a meteor? Or maybe it was the ship of the little gray guys. The skunk ape and Sasquatch hang out around here. And uh, well, was that thing that flew by, was that just a was that Mothman? Uh, but the, the solution to that, of course, is never observe alone, not when you're away from home. And uh, still talking about areas away from the backyard, uh, you might worry about the bad guys, but you also have to deal with the good guys. Now, there are a lot of urgent legend, urban legends and tales about astronomers with telescopes encountered by the police, and they think it's a cannon or something. Frankly, I think a lot of those stories are just stories and nothing more, but you may be confronted by law enforcement officers while in a public location. Uh, they will key in on anything they deem unusual and somebody standing out there or several people standing out there with these things are gonna be unusual. What you have to do is just keep cool, don't do anything rash. However, and follow their instructions, of course. However, assume you are not violating the rules of the park or location you're at. Be firm about your right to observe. You have as much right to be in the park as the couple sitting on a bench necking. Anyway, getting back to your backyard or city park, this is this is the the main thing you have to deal with in suburban and urban astronomy is not so much the sky glow. There's, other than filters, there's nothing you can do about that really. Your big enemy, which you can deal with, is ambient light. I'm talking about nearby lights like the porch light from your name, from your name, who, who and, and those lights are the things that hurt you most because those lights prevent you from uh, achieving even a modest level of dark adaptation, which you might otherwise achieve, and you might be able to see a lot more. And, and you know how it is. I remember years ago, I had a neighbor, and every time it seemed like every freaking time I'd go out with a telescope, she'd turn on her yard light. And I finally said, why do you have to turn on the yard light when I go out with a telescope? Oh, I thought I was helping you see. But uh, so it goes in urban astronomy. But, uh, how do you deal with ambient light? 
there are several considerations. Again, ambient light is what hurts you in urban and suburban observing. Uh, your yard probably has a corner that's shielded from ambient light. Uh, use it. Of course, the thing is, the average yard with trees and so on and so forth, you may find that you have to have uh, some logistical planning. Like I'm gonna observe uh, Taurus tonight, so I gotta be in this corner of the yard. And if I wanna look at uh, Cassiopeia later, I gotta pick up the telescope and move it over here. That's the stuff you'll learn to deal with when you're doing urban observing. But anyway, you can do things to protect yourself from ambient light. Uh, the other thing you want to think about when you're preparing to observe from home is how bad are your skies? I find a convenient uh, guide to that is Ursa Minor, the Little Dipper uh, asterism in Ursa Minor. Uh, the average really bad place, you will see Polaris and you will see the two end stars of the bowl with uh, beta being pretty good, gamma may be almost invisible. If you can see those three though, you can see some other stuff too. Of course, do your evaluation when the Little Dipper is away from the horizon. And again, shield your eyes from ambient light so you get some sort of dark adaptation. But if you have a sky that will uh, deliver magnitude four, at least away from the horizon, uh, you'll be amazed at what you can see. And what you're seeing on here was generated with Stellarium. That's a magnitude four sky. Magnitude three, you can see a lot more than you'd think from uh, magnitude three skies. How about magnitude two skies? Luckily, that's pretty rare. At magnitude two, uh, you can see Polaris, but uh, the rest of Ursa Minor is pretty much fading out. And, uh, it's not that you can't observe things, you can, no matter how bad your sky, but it makes things a little more difficult. How about a telescope? What sort of a telescope do you need for urban or suburban observing? Well, you've already got one, that's what you use, but uh, there are some suggestions I can make if you're uh, thinking about a first telescope, a new telescope, whatever. This was my gang from about, uh, this was from about the time that the Urban Astronomer's Guide was written. I bought that strange yellow tube, uh, baby poop yellow tube reflector, eight inch reflector, uh, because I wanted to have an eight inch telescope to use for the book that was not a Schmidt Cassegrain or a Dobsonian, but uh, those were the days. A minimalist telescope can be fine. A telescope like this, this is a four inch F10 refractor, Celestron refractor. Uh, it's gone by various, various names, but it's a good instrument. It's an acromat. The, uh, the, the advantage of a telescope like this is what if you have to, like I mentioned earlier, move from one corner of your yard to the other corner of your yard to the other corner of your yard, in the course of an observing session. You're not gonna to want to haul around even an eight inch Schmidt Cassegrain or an eight inch Newtonian reflector. A four inch reflector like this uh, C101 is I think what they used to call it. Uh, they've made these for years and years. This is very portable and you'd be quite surprised what a four inch F10 reflector can, refractor, excuse me, can deliver as far as the deep sky, if you give it a chance. Uh, if I had to recommend an optimum scope for the deep sky, it would be a longer focal length telescope simply because in the suburbs and in the city, we tend to use higher magnifications and a longer telescope makes it easier to attain those magnifications with comfortable longer focal length eyepieces. Higher power spreads out the ambient light in the sky background and makes your whatever uh, stand out better from a dark field. That's very important when you're trying to hunt things like Virgo galaxies from urban and suburban uh, uh, 
environments. And the fact is also that in my opinion, and I've long th th thought this, most amateur astronomers use too little um, magnification rather than too much. Uh, a lot of us came up being preached about, oh, don't use high magnification. That's for department store telescopes and use too little. Uh, more magnification rather than less while still framing your object the way you want it to will deliver for you in the city and the suburbs back big time because as I say, it helps darken the sky. The other thing, if portability is not a huge concern, is a go-to telescope now. If you can, other, in other words, set up in one spot in your yard and leave the telescope there the entire night, you don't have to dodge street lights. That is important because even for experienced astronomers who know the sky well, it's difficult to use a finder scope and especially a tell rad to find objects in a light polluted sky. You don't have many guide stars to see. An, a go-to telescope can make your urban and suburban observing far, far more enjoyable. And I can't emphasize how much uh, uh, that can add to it. When you don't spend half the night hunting for something in a light polluted pink sky, when you can actually see it and concentrate on observing what you can observe, you'll be a lot happier. Eight inches is good. However, I found even at my suburban site here where I have a zenith limiting magnitude of about five on a good night, that just that next click up from eight inches to 10 inches uh, makes a difference. Now I'm lazy these days. I would no more use a 10 inch or 11 inch telescope uh, for backyard observing, observing than flying to the moon. In fact, I sold my C11 years ago. However, uh, again, 10 inches can deliver real performance dividends. So I'm using for a lot of my backyard observing this humble Jumel 10 inch F5 Newtonian Dobsonian. Uh, it has the light gathering power you need Plus, it's not a huge pain to set up. I can have this telescope out in the back 40 and go in in about 10 minutes or less. Uh, it does not have go-to, but after 60 years of touring the sky, I can usually deal with the light pollution. Uh, one thing that helps me is you probably can't see in this picture, but in addition to the 50 millimeter finder, this also has a zero power uh, site. The combination of those two means it's a lot easier to find things uh, in light pollution. But I will admit to you that even after this many years, I do have trouble locating objects in heavily light polluted skies where you can't see enough stars to take you to objects. One thing I used to do when I was young and really uh, hardcore is instead of star hopping, I do something called eyepiece hopping. I'd go through Virgo hopping from one galaxy field to the next and never use a finder. I might use a finder to put it on the first galaxy. Then I'd use Uranometria or a program called Deep Space 3D to hop from eyepiece field to eyepiece field in Virgo and see all those galaxies from old Chaos Manor South where you know, magnitude three or 3.5 skies were, that was a good night. So it can be done. But I love this scope. Her name is Zelda. And uh, I've used her probably more than anything except for that four inch acromat over about the last seven years. She's a good telescope. Plus I got in on the, the Chinese uh, Dobsonians when the getting was good. This telescope delivered to my door in two days cost me less than $500. So. I'm still proud of that. Now, we do need to talk about a silly myth that has developed over the years. It goes, large aperture scopes collect more sky glow as well as more light from celestial objects. A smaller scope will show more in the city. The ground truth, aperture always wins. You don't believe me? Perform this experiment. Grab your buddy or somebody's or your 10 inch or 12 inch telescope, set it up. Set up a six inch next to it. Point both at Messier 13 and uh, have a look and tell me what you see. But I can tell you what you see. In the 12 inch, uh, M13 will be a huge globe of suns. 
In the six inch M13, and this is from Urban Skies, the six, in the six inch, it'll be a bright blob. Whether in the city or the country, more aperture always wins. As a matter of fact, more aperture is actually more important in the city. Under tremendously dark skies like at Prude Ranch, you will be flat out amazed at what a four inch telescope can do. In magnitude three skies, eh, not so much. Aperture always wins, but that's all things being equal. And for urban and suburban observers, things aren't always equal. If you have to go down six flights of stairs to get to a place where you can observe at your apartment building, you're not gonna want a big dom. You'll be happier with something like uh, this little ETX 125 of mine, Charity Hope Valentine. She's a good little telescope and that is something that she inhabits that, that range where she's not a huge pain to uh, set up even if you're, uh, like I said, in a place where you really have to maneuver to get outside and with five inches of aperture and a tiny short tube, she's got a lot of power. You have to kind of tailor, I guess I'm saying, your telescope to your uh, living arrangements. Uh, one thing I would also caution about with large aperture instruments, if you're a new astronomer, is believe me, if you get something that's too big and takes a lot of assembly, uh, you'll be tremendously happy with it for a month or so. And then after that first month with that big telescope, you'll keep finding excuses why you just can't go out and observe tonight. Well, there might be a crescent moon in the sky and I need to see my television show. Don't get carried away with aperture, even though, as I said, aperture always wins, but that's all things being equal. Small compound scope is often a better choice for a city dweller than a big dog. Yeah, don't get carried away. And by the way, those guys are not ZZ Top, although you might think they are. This is a telescope that is called the Beast. It lives in New Mexico now, but for many years, it lived down in Chiefland, Florida, and I was uh, lucky enough to observe with it. It's a 48 inch reflector built by Tom Clark, uh, who used to do Tektron telescopes. Uh, this is the only telescope I have ever used, this 48 inch, where I could see the horse head. I don't just mean as a little cutout in, in the background nebulosity. I mean, I could see B33, the actual horse head shape with direct vision on a good night with this 48 inch. The Fonder is a six inch refractor, but that's not something you're gonna haul down six flights of stairs, is it? Uh, and again, your enemy is ambient light, scattered light. Uh, curing it can be simple and crude like this, just tape a baffle to the back of your Newtonian so the reflected light from the ground isn't traveling up the tube to your diagonal and into your eyepiece. Uh, keep that ambient light, that scattered light out of your eyepiece to the best of your ability. You wanna look like a real dweeb and a geek? Well, who cares? It's in the dark and who's gonna see? Orion used to sell these uh, red goggles that you put these on like half an hour before you began to observe and whenever you need to go into the house to do whatever you do in the house or whatever, you'd put them back on. <clears throat> a lot of observers, a lot of urban and suburban observers don't go so far as to wear red goggles, but we, what we do is make a hood out of a piece of dark cloth. Go to the eyepiece, drape that hood over your head, the ambient light's gone, and you can give yourself a little time at the eyepiece, and you know you should give each object half an hour's observing time. Go to the eyepiece with that hood and you will be amazed at how much a little dark adaptation, thanks to that dark hood, can help you. And then we come to filters. When I first heard about filters, I guess in the 70s, the 1970s, I thought, well, you know, that's gonna fix things. Uh, we won't have to worry about a dark side anymore. If only it were that simple. As my friend here says, there ain't no such thing as a free lunch. They will not turn your backyard into the Prude Ranch for a number of reasons. 
The first is that, yeah, they block out the light of man-made sources, uh, street lights or whatever. Unfortunately, their passband admits the light of, excuse me, their band blocks ambient uh, street lights and so forth but the light of the stars is in that same band. What I'm saying is, and fumbling around, is that a filter blocks out street lights, but the light of the, the light of the stars is in that same range of wavelengths. So filters also dim the stars. They don't enhance stars, they dim them. Uh, that means they won't work with anything that's made out of stars, open and globular star clusters or galaxies. What they work on is nebulae. And they can work on nebulae quite well. Uh, now, some people over the years have said that the very mild filters like the Lumicon Deep Sky or the Orion Sky Glow can help galaxies a little bit. That they darken the background just a hair without dimming the, the light of the galaxy stars enough to, to extinguish it. I've tried that and tried that and tried that, and I've never seen much improvement. Now, you can maybe see some improvement with some filters on galaxies for imaging, but for visual, forget it. And they're also, let me also say, all that beside, avoid the mild filters like the Lumicon Deep Sky or the Orion Sky Glow simply because they're not good enough for the heavy light pollution of the typical suburb or urban environment. They can help a lot at a very dark site, but they're too mild to really help with the light pollution that we're talking about. My favorite all around filter is the Lumicon UHC. Our latest problem, and uh, I'm sure y'all recognize the name Kelly Beatty. Sky and Telescope, longtime editor. Uh, he and I did a lot of research and wrote up an article some years ago uh, on LED lighting. Unfortunately, LED lighting is more challenging for filters than mercury vapor or sodium was. Will somebody come up with a filter that helps a little bit more with LED lighting? That remains to be seen. What I know now is that most municipalities are converting to LED lighting. So that's, that's, a, that's a consideration before wasting money on filters. What's the ultimate solution? It's a little observatory. You might think it's crazy to have an observatory in the city or the suburbs. Not so. It's probably uh, more important to have something like this in the city or the suburbs than it is out in the country. Uh, an observatory would be the ultimate way to deal with that ambient light. Uh, I've never built an observatory just because I'm lazy and blah, 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 and uh, never have got around to it. But certainly, if you're up for one, uh, it can be a big help. And of course, it can also be a big help in that you can leave your gear set up. Uh, let me also add that, you know, uh, it's, it's pleasant to have, uh, friends of mine have observatories. It's pleasant to have all your gear in one spot, all your eyepieces out there. You don't have to rummage around, spend all afternoon setting up to observe. And you don't have to go as fancy as that. This is one that I built many years ago uh, for our club out at the Children's Science Museum I was talking about. It did work. After a few years, it started falling apart, but had a lot of fun there. Uh, we observed Comet Hale Box crash excuse me, the, we observed Comet hale Bop, and we also observed the Comet the Shoemaker, Shoemaker Levy 9 that crashed into Jupiter from this little observatory. That was 27 years ago, strange. I've always thought I might like one of these, but I've never invested in one either, one of the uh, uh, observatory tents. Kendrick used to make the one on the upper left. I think they discontinued them, but there are still uh, companies that make them. Uh, these are mainly, I think, something you might like to uh, have at a star party if you're an imager. They kind of help with people walking by with 
red lights that are too bright and stuff like that. I question their utility for the backyard. It's too much of a hassle to set them up. Now in the lower left corner, I don't know if these are made anymore, but a friend of mine bought these panels. They were easy to assemble and they did a fine job of blocking out ambient light in the backyard. Uh, they were light. They were basically PVC pipe with kind of canvas or muslin uh, panels. I thought they were the cat's meow. Of course, your Uncle Rod is very cheap, as you all know. So I came up with my own solution. This was the backyard of good old Chaos Manor South. And I said, why wouldn't a freaking stage flat work? And indeed it did. Uh, this one was unpainted because I used it. I think this was a photo from the Urban Astronomer book, but I later painted you know, the, the muslin black to make it even better. And I used this for years to keep those street lights, ambient light and kitchen lights and porch lights. The, the beauty of this idea was I didn't have to move my telescope around to find a dark corner. All I had to do was move my flat or flats have, I have a couple of them out there and make my own dark corner. We all know we pick up some observing tricks over the years, and these are as important in the suburbs and the city as they are in the country. Averted vision, use the dim light receptors of your eyes, look away from a dim object instead of straight at, at it, jiggle the scope, the human eye can pick up moving dim objects closer than stationary ones, probably to allow us to see that jaguar or leopard stalking us in the twilight when we were out on the savanna. Uh, of course, wait until an object is at least 30 degrees above the horizon before trying. That's, that's a good rule for anywhere, but especially in the city because the dust, the smoke, the everything else down at the horizon scatters light. It makes the light pollution even worse close to the horizon. And so what you wanna do is wait until that hard object, that M101 is at culmination. And of course, culmination simply means when an object is crossing the local meridian. Local meridian being that imaginary line that runs through the North Celestial Pole, down through the, celest the South Celestial Pole and back around and divides our sky into Eastern and Western halves. When an object rises, hits the meridian, that's as high as it ever will get. So elevation may not be great then, but that is as high as it ever will get. That's the best time to observe a difficult one. Well, how do you know when that's gonna be? Well, you can go the old fashioned way. If you know local sidereal time, you know what LST is, right? I don't mean LSMFT and lucky strikes or something. I mean, local sidereal time. Local sidereal time, if it's 14 hours of local sidereal time, that means the 14 hour line of right ascension is over your head and you can look up on a star chart or what, what objects lie along the 14 hour line. Useful to know. But these days we have the fricking computers and they can make uh, life a lot simpler for us. Uh, Planning programs in, in, in particular can show you what's up uh, any given time for the out of the list of objects you want to observe. One I like a lot is Phil Slang's Deep Sky Planner. Uh, this allowed me to observe, along with Sky Tools, which is also an excellent program, which we saw on the previous slide. This allowed me to observe all the thousands of Herschel objects in just three years. I really like Deep Sky Planner. I recommend it. Uh, if you have only messed with planetarium programs and uh, want to just give a planning program a try, Deep Sky, uh, the, uh, the developer, Steve Tuma, he decided he was tired of marketing it and it's now just freeware. You can download it and use it. Uh, these programs will not only show you what out of your list of objects, say the Messier you want to observe is in the sky right now. It can be sorted like any spreadsheet and uh, on magnitudes or any other thing you want to sort on. And it is a valuable tool for urban astronomers, very valuable, because we're often struggling to uh, 
knock out the bright ones as they get near the meridian and stuff like that, or the dim ones when they get near the meridian. They can do star charts too. Now here's the problem. A lot of us get disappointed uh, in what we're seeing when we're young astronomers, maybe not so young astronomers who move to the suburbs or the city. Uh, you look in that book and it says, Galaxy M101 has a magnitude of eight. You'll go, all right, magnitude eight. I can see that in my four inch. And you get your four inch telescope out and you look and you look and you look and never do you see M101 from your light polluted backyard. That's because that magnitude value you're seeing means how bright it would be if the object were squished down to the size of a star. The other way to look at that is when it says that Messier 101 is at magnitude eight. Imagine how dim it would be if you took a magnitude eight star and defocused it until it was about the size of a half degree field. So what you wanna know is something called surface brightness. And you can figure that out with a little math. It's not very difficult and I give it here. Uh, using that formula, magnitude eight, uh, this magnitude eight galaxy turns out to have a surface brightness of 14.2, which ain't exactly the same thing, is it? Uh, if you don't feel like doing math and scribbling on paper, uh, Sky Tools will calculate it for you as will most other planning programs. And we can see the M76 it says it has a surface brightness of 21.1, but it's not always that simple either. Smaller objects, despite low surface brightness are easier to see than big ones. And luckily the little dumbbell is easy enough to see. Same with M32, it's not so big as it becomes a real problem. In the deep sky game, as you know, the bigger the harder, the bigger the harder. Brightness or dimness beside, the bigger something is, the harder it is, galaxy or nebula or whatever, the bigger it is, the harder it is. I had no trouble some years ago, I took it into my mind, I wanted to image some quasars with a C11 down at the Chiefland Astronomy Village. I had absolutely no problem going to 17th magnitude with a C11 and a sensitive camera. Uh, I could have gone far deeper. It's just that when you make a list of quasars dimmer than magnitude 17, you get an awful long list, campers. But this is really an important thing to remember when you're observing in the suburbs and the city where objects are a challenge. Bigger, harder, smaller, easier. Maybe this is the ultimate urban observing tool. That is a Malin Cam Extreme. There's certainly something to be said for going out there, hunting these objects in our bright skies, bringing home the details you can bring home no matter what. But you know what? After doing a lot of that, there comes a point, well, yeah, I have seen M101 and I've seen M74. They look like sort of a blob that I could almost see. Wouldn't it be nice if I could see details in those objects from my backyard? These video cameras will let you. This was a first generation called a Stellacam. And this is what I could do from my backyard. M1, you see the tendrils. That was some little unauspicious comment. M51, uh, NGC 5195, not a problem. Uh, the fingers of God in the, uh, like the famous Hubble image, right there from my backyard. Of course, now, you know, there's always that trade-off. You can see a lot more with a deep sky video camera than you can with your eye, but then you have to have a display and maybe a, a, a digital recorder and cables and batteries. So that's just another one of the things to consider when you're developing an observing program. But it sure was nice to see the crab looking like that after all those years in the backyard of Mr. Krabby being a little dim oval. What a revelation. And the Eagle Nebula looking like that with his wings spread. And, oh man, I was a happy camper. Of course, people are trying to do stuff about light pollution. I sense that's somewhat of a losing battle, but you never know. There may be come the time when, you know, 
we finally figure out oil is not cheap and uh, we don't need a street light every two feet just to feed the electric company. That hasn't happened yet, unfortunately. And finally, before I leave you, the Urban Astronomer's Guide. Uh, writers, I often write a book and then I don't want to see it for forever or ever again. This is the one book I've done. I've done about seven books over the years that I, I still am very happy with. It's not perfect, but I'm still very happy with it. I wouldn't change a thing. I've never pushed to have a second edition of this one. I don't think it needs it. The observing materials in there haven't changed. Yeah, Sky Tools is in Sky Tools 4 instead of Sky Tools 2 now, but so what? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm proud of this book. I really am. And now, uh, I think we have some time. I don't know about time limits. I've got another meeting coming up, but I will certainly take every question that you guys can ask. Awesome. Thank you, Rod. And Rod, would you mind uh, stopping the share so we can see each other a little bit better? There? Yeah, I sure will stop it right now. All right. Um, so yeah, let's open it up for questions. Anything uh, for Rod, folks? Well, y'all must be experts now. That's what I tell my physics students. Hey, uh, uh, Rod, um, I met you several years ago down in Virginia at the um, at the uh, Novak uh, meeting. You you were there. I'll never forget your presentation. I've read a lot about your um, uh, electronic assisted astronomy uh, endeavors with Mallon cams and things like that. I was curious if you're still very active in that because I'm really getting into that now. This is a uh, Stan, you're kind of freezing up on me a little bit, but I can't answer that. <clears throat> I still do it, but I do it in an old fashioned way. I'm still using my mailing cam because it works great. However, right now, the electronically assisted astronomy, what we used to call video astronomy in the dark ages, is undergoing a transition. Uh, you won't be surprised to hear me say it's going from analog to digital. And what that means is in, back in the day, the mailing cams and the stellar cams were essentially digital devices as far as the image sensor, but they put out analog video, uh, composite video, RGB video, whatever. Now what you're seeing is digital. Uh, my observation is, and, and one of the reasons I think the mailing cam, original mailing cam is still for sale, is the digital cameras make it a lot easier to get still images into your uh, computer for processing, they tend to be less sensitive than the old analog cameras. But yes, I, I still do it. In fact, I'm gonna try to get out with my mailing cam this month and image a few Herschels. It's been too cold for me to do that over the last month or two. Why it's been down to 20 degrees every once in a while. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, I have a question about how would you deal uh, going up to neighbors and asking them to turn off lights or, or, or whatever, you know, so how do you would handle that social aspect of, of uh, doing that kind of thing? The problem, the problem with that is not so much that you can't go up to your neighbor and say, could you turn off your porch light, you know, tonight or blah, 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 blah. Uh, it's, it's not that because and most people will understand and cooperate, but the next night is the same thing all over again. Well, I turn on my porch light when it gets dark. I turn on my porch light when it gets dark. I turn on my kitchen lights. I got to have my kitchen lights on so I can make beefaroni. The, the answer is not to try to get your neighbors to turn off their lights. That's a losing game. The, 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 the way to go is, like I said, find ways to protect yourself from ambient light. Find ways to protect yourself from ambient light, whether that's a light shield, or moving to a different part of your yard for observing a particular part of the sky. Uh, believe me, I've been through all this stuff that you're talking about decades ago. And yeah, Aunt Jenny will turn off her porch light, but you know, next night it's gonna be on and around and around we go. So that's what I advise. Work to shield yourself from light without you know worrying about what Aunt Jenny's gonna do. Rod, this Anybody is, else? Yeah, Rod, this is Wyatt. I was just going to say to that blocking ambient light, when I came to New Hampshire from Texas, I 
for the very first time encountered snow uh, during observing, never done it before, but you, what you really see really quickly is the snow reflects even more light back up than, than I'd ever encountered before. And so your advice on blocking out ground light was really important. That wouldn't be a problem for me because I can tell you if I lived up where there was snow, you wouldn't find me out observing nothing until spring. Uh, I saw enough snow in Bath, Maine to last me a lifetime and I don't need any more snow. Other questions from anybody on anything. Doesn't have to be necessarily on urban astronomy. Any questions you might have on the, the astronomy game. Uh, Rob, a fantastic presentation. Really enjoyed it and learned a lot. So thank you. My question for you is, do you have any recommendations on where to buy uh, a telescope secondhand? Uh, you know, the best place to buy a secondhand telescope is at your local club or a neighboring club. Uh, another occasional possibility is something like Craigslist. Barring that, uh, what you've got is probably the classified ads on the Cloudy Nights uh, bulletin board website. Uh, Astromart is another site. It, it is basically mostly a classified astronomy ad site, but uh, over the years it's kind of declined as far as I know. I haven't visited uh, Astromart in years and uh, uh, I don't know that it's very practical to, to try to buy stuff off of them anymore. Cloudy nights, your local club, uh, the best telescope, the best used telescope is one you can look at in person. One you can look at in person. I, I urge that. I urge that if at all possible. And thanks for your kind words about my presentation. Anything else before I hit that button that my students love the best? Just kind words. Love love the books. It's a little bit difficult. I, I wanted to get them signed, but we can't really do that over Zoom. Well, one day things will be back to some semblance of normal. And uh, boy, just uh, what Stan said about Novak, those were the days. Those were the days. I used to go up and down the country, across the country to the to from from Pennsylvania to Wisconsin to Oregon to California. I've even been to the freaking Idaho Star Party, but uh, that seems like a long time ago now. After the year of the plague. Any other questions? Rodna, uh, uh, this is John Lemaitre. I apologize. I don't have a video camera on this on this uh, computer. Oh, um, I definitely enjoyed the the presentation. I just kind of wanted to um, follow up with that. Um, uh, the discussion about um, aperture in, in city viewing versus urban viewing. One thing I found um, is that because the exit pupil formed by the eyepiece is what kind of controls the, the background light pollution, but stars themselves are governed purely by the aperture. Um, I found that if you increase magnification against star clusters, you can actually dim the, uh, the sky glow without dimming the stars. And you can actually kind of add contrast that way. And I was just kind of wondering if that's something that you'd, you'd sort of seen in your, in your observing and if that's, um, if that's something that might be kind of like worth doing for uh, urban observing. Oh, most assuredly, like I said, the benefit is that that smaller exit pupil spreads, basically what you're doing is spreading out the background glow in your field. And uh, that is highly useful on globular clusters. I use the example of M13 or open clusters, but don't, forget to try higher magnification on extended objects too, like galaxies and nebula. It can help almost as much with them. Yes, it's a huge, important uh, uh, aid with star clusters, individual stars like binaries, et cetera, et cetera. Use more power in the city on everything. Use more magnification. In fact, I'll say again, because this has been a crusade of mine, most amateur astronomers don't use enough magnification, whether they're in the city or in the country. But yes, that, that's a, a very important point. It can help, help dramatically with star clusters. <laughs> Anything else?
Okay, Wyatt, thanks very much for having me. I enjoyed it so much. And, uh, you know, it's not like I could be up there with you guys. That would be great. But uh, this is almost like that a little bit. But, uh, <laughs> well, Rod, we really appreciate it. Um, great presentation and just really good to meet you. And yes, thanks for all the books over the years. Really useful resources. So uh, clear skies down there in Alabama, and we'll hope to see you soon. Uh, let me add that if anybody has any question that they haven't thought of, I don't make a secret of my email. It's just my name, Rod Malise at southalabama.edu. Rod Malise at southalabama.edu, and I'll be happy to answer your questions. And one of these days, I may even, if I can convince my sorry butt to get out in the cold, my, it's probably 60 right now, and do any observing, I will update the Astro blog again. Good night, everybody, and thank you so much for your kindness. That's right. Night, thank you. That's right. Now I'm going to push that, that button my students love so much. Leave. <laughs> Good night, all. Good night. Thank you, Rod.